Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you for joining Multnomah Group's uh, monthly webinar series. Today's topic is uh, an update on retirement plan litigation. Uh, what we plan to do is sort of focus on sort of the, the history of some of the litigation of what we've seen, talk about how some of the case pleadings have changed a little bit and sort of what we're seeing in sort of the newest string of, <clears throat> of lawsuits. Uh, I did see a question about the slides, so maybe we'll start with a couple housekeeping items. Uh, the Q&A uh, is available and we will answer questions throughout the presentation if you want to just use that. I see that someone has already made use of that. Um, also, there is a question about the slides. The slides will be distributed at the conclusion of, the, uh, of, of today's webinar. So thank you for that. Um, my name is Greg Johnson. I'm a senior consultant and director of the ERISA Technical Services Committee here at Multnomah Group. Uh, I am joined by Candace Finn, who is a senior retirement plan an analyst and JD student, so future lawyer joining me today. <clears throat> For those of you that might not be familiar with Multnomah Group, here's a slide just covering some of the background. We actually just celebrated our 20th anniversary. Uh, so been serving as a retirement investment advisor for over 20 years. Uh, we currently have 166 clients that sponsor 272 plans, uh, accounting for over $31 billion in assets. So happy to be uh, presenting to you today. Uh, I thought I'd start with a little bit about sort of where we've been. Uh, you know, really the history I would say probably the Schlichter Bogard law firm was probably the pioneer in uh, excessive fee litigation, ERISA litigation focused on plan sponsors, primarily focused on billion dollar plans and, and larger. And I think, you know, sort of the early uh, cases primarily alleged that, hey, you're a mega plan, you're a big employer you could have negotiated lower fees on behalf of uh, lower record keeping fees uh, for the benefit of your participants. And you know that was really, it was more focused not necessarily on specific decisions that the committee made. It was just that you didn't meet your fiduciary duty because you should have negotiated lower fees. Uh, the other sort of, I think, low hanging fruit was uh, lower share classes. So uh, you know, a, a plan sponsor maybe had a lower cost share class available to them, but didn't take the action to to do something about them. So again, the early cases sort of focused on on inaction or lack of activity by by a committee. Uh, I think we'll talk a little more about how that's changed a little bit. I think we're digging. I think plaintiffs are digging in a little deeper on uh, how decisions are made by committees, not not the lack of addressing an issue with their plan. Um, the volume of new cases, though, it has slowed down. Um, but what we are seeing an increase in is the number of cases that are settling. And I think one of the things we're going to talk about is uh, sort of what happens after a case survives a motion to dismiss by the defendants. Um, the, the chances of a case settling after a judge uh, does not favor uh, rule in favor of a defendant on a motion to dismiss goes up quite a bit because now you're starting to, to talk about getting into rather substantive legal fees to continue to defend your position. Um, oftentimes, it might not even be the plan sponsor that decides to settle. It might be their insurer that says, hey, we got to settle this thing. Um, but we've definitely seen an increase in cases settling. Uh, over the last four years, there have been 111 cases that have, that have settled. Uh, 12 cases were settled in 2020 compared to 42 that were settled uh, just last year. The total monetary penalty of these 111 cases is $910 million. So we're almost up to a billion dollars in settlements of these excessive fee uh, lawsuits. The average settlement has been $8.2 million. Um, on the right, you can see some of the college and university settlements ranging anywhere from $6.5 million at University of Chicago to upwards of $13.5 million at USC. Now, the thing about these settlements, obviously, there's a monetary component. But when you think about, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of the, a lot of the smaller plans probably aren't ever going to be subjected to litigation. Um, but I, I think these settlements definitely provide an opportunity to sort of think about 
sort of what are the basic building blocks of, of uh, good fiduciary practice. And so these are what we, we've seen in almost all of the settlements. We see pretty consistent non-monetary re requirements being placed on the plan sponsor. And, and like I said, I think these are the building blocks of building uh, or having a good uh, fidu fiduciary baseline for how you manage your plan. So a few of these are to implement mandatory annual fiduciary training for your uh, retirement or investment committee, uh, review periodically and adopt the lowest cost share class that's available for the investments in the plan, uh, hiring a third party independent consultant, uh, almost all the settlements do require a new RFP. Uh, our recommended best practice is that you probably go out into the marketplace every five to seven years, uh, conduct an RFP. We do provide uh, annual fee benchmarking, but uh, which which is a good uh, you know a good marker to see where you're at. But really, the best way to understand what the value of your plan is in the open marketplace is to conduct an RFP. Uh, we've seen some of the settlements include some restrictions on the record keeper's use of participant data. And uh, especially in the college and university plans, sometimes there's some legacy investments that the plan sponsor doesn't really have any control over. We have seen some of those university settlements have a requirement that you periodically notify the participants in those funds of their ability to transfer out. So you know, I think when you think about what your role is as a fiduciary, these are some really good starting points. And, you know, while we've seen the the amount of litigation or the number of cases filed decreasing, uh, there are there is still quite a bit of activity in, in the in the excessive fee space. Maybe I'll turn it over to Kansas Candace to sort of give us a, an idea of where we're at today. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. So when we're looking at excessive fee litigation, you know, I think when you're looking at some of the history of that, Lawsuits continue to use 5,500 filing data in order to um, calculate those fees. So it really causes a little bit of fee inflation because it also includes transactional fees. So when plaintiff attorneys are bringing their allegations, they're usually a little bit more inflated. So this is where that meaningful benchmark comes up, which I think a lot of us have heard over time. Um, so, you know, one of the things of, I think it was an old court case back in 2022 was, you know, the key to nudging and inference of imprudence from possible to plausible is providing a sound basis for comparison or a meaningful benchmark. You can't just allege costs are too high or cost returns are too low. So I was in the Eighth Circuit, and I mentioned that because, um, you know, as we go on to and we're looking at pleading standards of how a case can end up moving forward from uh, actually just the allegations to end up having to go to court, which of course is incredibly costly. We've kind of noticed some trends where in the sixth, eighth, and tenth circuits, they're a little bit more uh, employer friendly. Whereas, you know, I think if you see some trends geographically in federal district judges for New York, Texas, and Florida, these, you know, the cases have been advanced without really closely looking at those benchmarks, and the judges have said, you know, this isn't really the place to be doing that. Uh, one of the more interesting cases, though, that we have seen recently is Brookings versus Northeastern University. It was a class action that uh, challenged the fees and investment performance of its employees' retirement plan after a Boston federal judge declined to closely examine the lawsuit's benchmarks. Um, the judge pretty much said, you know, this isn't, this is, it's inappropriate to do so at the motion to dismiss stage in an ERISA lawsuit. So here, I think we're seeing, you know, how pleading standards to get a case from the plaintiff's perspective, what really needs to happen in order to get it from um, the allegations all the way to uh, to court. Um, so that way this case proceeds forward. Uh, you kind of notice here that it's more than it just excessive fees now and excessive fee allegations are really coming to, becoming the base of that. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what we're seeing is, as these cases proceed and some courts dismiss them, some let them move forward, uh, you know, all the other plaintiff's attorneys out there watch that, right? And, and they're sort of developing and evolving the manner in which they file these lawsuits. And I said, you know, that in the initial sort of round, it was it was focusing on, hey, you've got this committee and your committee didn't do what it's supposed to do. Uh, you know, I think where the evolution has come forward so that now they're looking at specific decisions that a committee has made relative to the investments offered in the plan and challenging those decisions. And 
Uh, one of the first ones that we saw is uh, uh, 11 lawsuits that were filed against plan sponsors that were utilizing the BlackRock Life Path series as their qualified default investment alternatives. So anyone who didn't make an election was automatically defaulted into the Life Path series. Uh, these cases were largely identical, if not completely identical. Uh, all of them claimed that the plan sponsors only looked at cost as the only factor in making the selection. And they alleged that, look, there are other target date funds available that maybe they cost a little more, but the investment returns that participant or I as a participant would have experienced would have been superior. And you didn't even consider any of those. Um, the problem, though, with this was that uh, the plaintiffs in all of these cases, uh, they pointed to about three or four different investment options. Uh, and it is true that they did show that they had better returns, <clears throat> but there were some, some dissimilarities between these funds, specifically the, the uh, life path target date funds. They have a target date at our expected retirement age of 65, whereas a lot of the comparative funds had sort of their landing place for their final allocation out to as far as age 72. So the glide paths really weren't even comparable. And, uh, you know, as far as the success of these lawsuits, these have been very unsuccessful. I think all but one will probably ultimately be dismissed, probably all 11. Um, there really wasn't a sound basis to challenge the decision other than saying, hey, you should look at all these other funds that did better. And I think the courts have been pretty consistent in saying, we're not going to, we're not going to take your decision and look at it four years later based on what the other options were and make a determination. Well, that one didn't turn out the best. So that was probably not the right decision. So they're not going to challenge the decision. They're going to check what they're going to review is the process that was utilized to make that decision. But, uh, you know, I think the point here is that we're definitely seeing plaintiff's attorneys not just saying, hey, you're not running your plan correctly. They're saying, let's look under the hood. Let's see what's in the plan and determine whether or not it's it's appropriate for your participants. And another similar case is uh, the Salesforce case, which I'll let uh, Candace speak to. Yeah, thanks, Greg. So the Salesforce case was a case that was originally brought um, in October of 2020 in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and it ended up being revived mostly because it's the pleading standards as we were talking about, as Greg kind of mentioned, you know, I would love to say excessive fees plus in, in some ways. And But one of the really interesting things here was that it focused on the CITs that would potentially be available to the client and the plan. Um, but how the court got to that, though, was they actually ended up bringing in an expert to during the pleading to say that, you know, the lack of publicly available information for CITs, Collective Investment Trust, um, really didn't discourage from the prudent, pr you know, prudent fiduciary from choosing them. So it's, you know, back to that process that Greg was talking about, that if, you know, you have lower options available based on this expert's testimony that was brought in, that this should be available within the plan. So by not moving to those lower share classes, that was potentially an issue and part of the reason of uh, why the case is moving forward. So, Greg, do you want to expand a little bit on collective investment trusts? Yeah, I mean, I think this I think this is an area that we're probably going to see a lot more activity. The use and the the availability of collective investment trusts has really increased, and the type of collective investment trusts that are out there is increasing. So, uh, you know, the biggest difference between a mutual fund and a collective investment trust is uh, the regulatory environment. So, the SEC does not regulate CITs, which generally allows them to be offered at a lower cost. So, uh, you know, there is a legitimate argument that says, hey, you're using mutual funds, but there's a very similar, a lot of CITs mirror the, the strategy used in the mutual fund. So it's almost like a share class change argument, right? You have this one investment, there's the same company offers virtually the identical investment using virtually the exact same uh, investment strategy at a lower cost. So you should be moving to that. Um, you know, it's just some of the, well, the other reason I think we're going to see a uh, proliferation of, of CITs is uh, some of the investments that you can hold inside a CIT are a little different than what you would be able to hold in a mutual fund. So we're starting to see new CITs that maybe have a private equity sleeve or have a fixed annuity portion that you really couldn't do in a in, in a, a mutual fund. 
Um, <clears throat> I, I do think though, you know, for if someone's considering CITs, there are some things to think about. There, there are some relatively complex legal agreements that have to be completed. Uh, there's not as much as it indicates here. There's not as much public information that you see on on a uh, that you would get from a, a mutual fund. Uh, I think there may be some concerns about the exit provisions. So if you decide to move away from a particular CIT, what's the process to do that? Is it cashable? You can't really move it in kind. So again, I think CITs are going to continue to become very, very popular. There's more and more of them available. Uh, the uh, investment minimums are dropping lower and lower. Uh, so I think you're going to continue to see CITs being very popular in the marketplace. But I do think as a fiduciary, you should take the time to consider and look at it from all angles before you just adopt it because it has a lower, lower cost. So again, the new, the new cases are really, we still see, you're always going to see an allegation that you had an investment that either underperformed or was too expensive. Uh, and the reason you're probably always going to see that piece is you have to prove money damages, right? You have to say, hey, I don't have as much money as I would have had, or this cost me more than it otherwise would have, and therefore I'm damaged. So that's how, you know, that's how you get the paycheck at the end of the day. So I think you're, again, you're always going to see some type of allegation that's financially focused in order to show damages. But the, the plaintiffs are really evolving how they are framing their argument to say, you used a process that was it so you didn't do anything you didn't do anything wrong by not acting you did act but the manner in which in the process that you used to make your decision to select this investment was flawed and that's the reason i've been damaged and that's really what you see in this snyder versus united health group uh this is i call it the the hand in the cookie jar case which is something that the judge referred to in allowing the case to move forward and this is a challenge to the use of the wells fargo target date funds and uhg had over seven billion dollars of plant assets invested uh, plaintiffs claim that they have underperformed relative to both benchmark and peers and again, you can't just say, hey, it underperforms, so I get to move my case forward. There has to be some other reason for it. So in this case, the plaintiffs uh, did a deeper dive into the process that the fiduciary committee used. And they said that UHG acted imprudently and disloyally in offering these underperforming funds. And what the allegation is, is that the committee took into consideration business factors specific to UHG that weren't in the best interest of participant. Most notably, uh, they pointed out that Wells Fargo uses UHG as their health insurance provider. So there's a, a alleged conflict of interest there. And also the UHG is the largest investor in that suite of target date funds. And, and the plaintiffs say that uh, you know, these two factors allowed you to make a decision that was not in my best interest by using these underperforming funds. So again, you can't just say, hey, look, the decision just didn't turn out right. There's better funds, but you have to say outside factors influence the committee in making this decision that negatively impacted me. Now, UHG argues, hey, we have an independent third-party investment advisor that helps us make these decisions and helped recommend these Wells Fargo funds. So we did act independently. There wasn't any outside uh, influence into this, into this decision. And the judge, in denying the motion to dismiss, indicated that, hey, that might be true, that you, this was done completely independent and the plaintiff's allegations are false, but just stating it now isn't sufficient to allow you to avoid taking this thing to trial. So again, this is a case that we're going to continue watching uh, pretty closely. I think the main point here, though, is you, you know, as a fiduciary, you really want to, as you make decisions, really think about is this being made in the best interest of our participants? And there's gonna be another really good example of this in the American Airlines case that Candace will talk about in a minute. But before we get there, uh, another area of litigation is around environmental, social, and governance rules. Um, there have been several cases filed. Uh, this continues to be a very hot political topic. Uh, so before we talk about the cases, uh, about a year and a half ago, the DOL issued their final ESG rule, which largely over, well, there was a Trump era ESG rule that was passed right before the election. Uh, the Biden administration almost immediately indicated that they weren't going to enforce that rule and they were going to replace it with a new rule. 
Uh, I think before we talk about the case law, uh, maybe I'll have Candace just sort of revisit what that DOL ESG rule was. Yeah, so, you know, the current DOL ESG rules, as we have listed here, you know, investment decisions must continue to be based on risk and return analysis, but you can include ESG considerations. So when Greg talks about that prudent process is, pr prudent process is part of investment selection, according to this D DOL ESG rule, ESG considerations can be included. Selection of uh, QDIA or your default option can use some of the ESG considerations um, as other investments. Fiduciaries may use ESG considerations when deciding similar investments, but of course it's as a tie-breaking standard. So you have to have you know, two similar investments that would potentially bring the same benefit that ESG can be that tiebreaker on which one you choose. And fiduciaries may consider plan participants' non-financial preferences when selecting investments for the plan. Um, so I know a few years ago when ESG was really hot, a lot of sometimes we would have plan sponsors be like, hey, our participants are asking for ESG options. According to the DOL ESG rule, this is saying, you know, this is something that you can take into consideration. Um, but of course, you know, some of these provisions are being challenged and I'll let Greg talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and when you look at these provisions, I mean, the one notable one is selection of the default option. Uh, there, there was no question under the rule, under the Trump DOL, it specifically did not allow ESG considerations for that default option. So even after this rule came out, uh, you know, well, a lot of our clients use an ESG suite of funds, which I think this is very clear from the rule. It is absolutely allowed uh, to, to have that ESG suite. So we continue to offer them and work with clients that want to include these types of investments in their plan. I do think the two things that we've continued to uh, consult on is, you know, what, what are ESG best practices? I mean, again, this rule does provide leeway to use ESG factors, but I think our recommendations are still the same, which is uh, I probably wouldn't offer a 100% ESG focused investment lineup to your participants. And I also, even though it indicates it's allowed here, would not recommend uh, offering ESG focused in, uh, funds as your QDIA. And I think someone could ask me, well, why would that be your advice when this rule seems to allow both those things? Well, it's because rules change, right? I mean, under the Trump era, it was a very different rule that was not enforced. Uh, if, if uh, <clears throat> you know, after the next presidential election, uh, it can certainly change again. And I wouldn't want to put any plan in a position where you have to revamp your whole lineup based on a new DOL rule that came out. So again, we're fully supportive of using ESG investments, but maybe just not solely using ESG investments. So this rule was uh, immediately challenged by 26 Republican attorney generals. They filed suit in the Northern District of Texas uh, why in the Northern District of Texas? Well, because there's only one federal judge there who has traditionally been sympathetic to Trump era policies. Uh, so definitely did a little uh, judicial shopping around to make sure they had a judge that they felt was favorable. Uh, these Republican attorneys claim that the tiebreaker rule, well, let's go back to this for a second. So this tiebreaker rule is what they're challenging. Uh, what I find interesting is I thought if any part of this rule would be challenged, I thought it'd be this last one. Fiduciaries may consider participants non-financial preferences when selecting investments for the plan. Um, I really thought that maybe this was a bridge too far that actually allows you to say, hey, I'm going to take some other factors into consideration. You know, I had not seen anything before where just because of a group of employees is asking for an investment that you put it in the plan. Um, I think the key portion of this particular aspect of the rule, though, is you can take that under advisement that your participants want to have this type of investment, but you still need to run it through the same fiduciary process and oversight as you would absolutely any other investment in the plan. So while on its face, it seemed to be a bridge too far, I think in practice, that particular portion of the rule uh, does have some basis that you can take it into, into consideration as long as you're still following every bit of the process that you have in place to select other investments. So again, these attorney generals claim that uh, essentially the tiebreaker rule allows a fiduciary to wear two hats, potentially allowing considerations of factors that are not in the best interests of participants. I mentioned they, they shopped for a judge that may be favorable to their cause. Uh, ultimately, that judge did dismiss the case. Uh, 
Uh, the main points of the dis dismissal were that ERISA, ERISA on its face does not forbid ESG factors in any way, and also pointed to the fact that under the DOL rule, fiduciaries cannot subordinate financial factors to ESG considerations. So again, the DOL clearly allows for taking into consideration ESG factors, but sort of what I was talking about with that last taking into consideration, you know, employee opinions or recommendations, uh, you still have to run those ESG funds through the same uh, filter for selection and monitoring as you would any other investment. And if it's not meeting those standards, it should be removed. Uh, these Republican attorney generals are appealing to the Fifth Circuit. So that's another one that we'll be keeping an eye on. I mentioned the American Airlines case. So I'll let Candace give an update on this one. Yeah, so uh, Spence versus American Airlines, uh, it was a case actually in, in the Northern District of Texas uh, near Fort Worth. And truthfully, the case started last summer when you know traditional allegations were brought against the 403B plan, excessive fee allegations, and so on. Um, but it was as well as the ESG allegations for um, having that as part of the prudent process and so on. But it was really interesting because the original plaintiff that had brought that case actually was only invested in the self-directed brokerage account. So they didn't have any standing, which is really you know the right of a party to challenge the conduct of another party. So the right of that plaintiff to challenge the American Airlines 401k plan. But they in September, they actually ended up completely rechanging their complaint, which was really, really interesting. Um, and instead their complaint alleged that American Airlines corporate policy that was really focused on ESG influenced the decision process for the investments within the retirement plan. And that was really interesting because it was something we hadn't really seen before in this landscape. And it was also on top of that too, the judge allowed it to move forward saying that, you know, based on the pleading standards, that this allegations could potentially be linked together that, you know, American Airlines did have that corporate policy. And so it could potentially be um, influence how then that corporation was administering their plan. Uh, so one of the things too, is they were also really focused as Greg has mentioned before was on that decision-making process. So the influence of the ESG on the decision-making process, that was something that was continually mentioned as part of um, the opinion after it was released. And then, you know, looking at the original complaint that that shift was also kind of odd how that was ended up being allowed in September and how this ended up being moved forward. So we're not sure if this is going to be something that we see more of, but I think, um, you know, in this case, this is American Airlines is just kind of one of the unlucky corporations to be really at the forefront of this new ESG allegations and how people are continuing, how plaintiffs are continuing to um, go after retirement plans. Yeah, this was definitely a shift in what we've seen in the past because you know, I was saying that some of those other cases pointed to a specific investment that underperformed or a specific decision. Um, and as Candace said, in the original pleading, you look at the pleading, you say, well, I don't, it doesn't look like this plaintiff even owns any ESG named or ESG focused funds. So I don't even understand what, how are you, how are you damaged? Um, you know, but then in the, in the refiled pleadings, they said that, Hey, your your company has this ESG focused corporate policy. You've been very open and public about it. A bunch of the senior people in your organization are on your fiduciary committee who support those ESG policies. So your committee actively shopped for a firm, in this case BlackRock, that embeds ESG philosophies throughout their entire investment decision making process. So it doesn't matter if it's named an ESG fund or some sort of socially responsible fund you've picked a company that's going to allow those uh, allow those ESG principles to drive their investment decisions. So again, very different uh, from what we've seen in the past. I, I don't know if it really has legs. I do struggle with these cases that, in my opinion, are challenging unsettled investment philosophies and strategies. Um, you know, as it relates to ESG, there is certainly an, a counter argument uh, that says, hey, if you invest in companies that are supporting good ESG principles, that is a sound investment strategy that will yield superior returns over time, not an inferior uh, investment strategy that is going to harm my returns. So again, I don't feel like that principle is necessarily settled in investment circles. 
I, I think we saw a similar uh, thing happening in the early excessive fee lawsuits. There were some that tried to claim, hey, you're using an actively managed suite of target date funds. You should be using index funds because they're less expensive. Again, this is similar to the ESG thing. That's not really a settled investment uh, philosophy that indexing is superior to active management. I think five years ago, maybe the argument that indexing was superior maybe could have been made. I think if you look at returns over the last two years, we've really seen uh, active managers adding a lot more value to investment returns. So again, this idea that you can challenge uh, concepts that are really unsettled seems pretty diff that seems to be a pretty difficult thing to prove in my opinion but we'll definitely keep an eye uh, on this one <clears throat> the other area that we're seeing an expansion is uh, again as i've said they i think plaintiffs attorneys are uh, looking under the hood a little more than they had in the past really looking at the investment services so not just the investment but the services that are offered in the plan and Here's two cases that we're, we're tracking, uh, the Goss versus Dover Corporation. This is an allegation that Dover offered uh, a managed account service in their plan. And so typically the way a managed account service is, is promoted and sold to plan sponsors is, hey, it doesn't cost the plan anything to offer this. This is just sort of an add-on service. And if a plan participant wants a little more assistance or a little more customized investment strategy than maybe what they see by building it themselves or what they see through the, the default or target date options, they can pay an additional fee and we'll run them through this model and create a sort of a customized uh, uh, investment mix for them. And, you know, it takes into consideration factors that aren't necessarily taken into consideration for a target date fund, things like, uh, you know, outside assets, uh, my expected retirement date, uh, thing, things like that. Just additional factors to try and create a more customized solution. And in this case, essentially what the, what the plaintiffs are saying is, hey, you offered this service, but the output was not materially different than anything that I got from the target date fund. So I paid extra money for this service and basically got the same outcome that I would have gotten if I just used the target date fund you're liable because you put that service in the plan and, and it made it available to me. Uh, another, another case is Schaefer versus Empower. Uh, this one, rather than targeting the plan sponsor, targets the record keeper, which is of course Empower Retirement. And in this case there, the allegation is that Empower itself misrepresented how the advisors that are, that are soliciting these managed accounts, how their compensation relates back to the managed account service and also misrepresented the way services are provided by these advisors. So uh, another expansion that we're seeing, I think in, uh, in the original cases, it was more often than not the plan sponsor that was the targeted defendant. We are seeing some that are focusing on the investment advisor and the record keeper rather than the plan sponsor. <clears throat> I think as far as the practice pointers re related to uh, managed accounts or other custom QDIA or other services, add-on services that you can put on the plan, I, I think it's really critical to remember that, uh, you know, I think, I think sometimes these are promoted as, well, hey, it's just participant choice. So if people want to use it, let them use it. If they don't, they don't have to pay for it. But you as a fiduciary are still responsible for the decision that puts that service into the plan, even if it's lightly utilized. Uh, it's still something that you need to understand uh, fully when you adopt it for the plan and monitor on an ongoing basis. So, you know, our recommendation is that you review the compensation and marketing strategies related to any fee-based services offered in the plan. Uh, also included on this slide, when we send it out after the presentation, there is a direct link to uh, one of our level three training pieces that talks about managed accounts and really recommendations on uh, how you should consider them if you want to add them to your plan and how you should monitor them if you decide to add them to the plan. <clears throat> so what are we seeing as sort of some new activity from litigation? I think uh, one case that we have here is a, a focus on personally identifi uh, identifiable <laughs> information, uh, Sherwood versus Horizon Actuarial Services. Again, <clears throat> this is a case that's not focused on a specific plan sponsor, 
but on a company that provides retirement plan services to plan sponsors. And in this case, Horizon provides actuarial and administrative services to multiple retirement plans. Uh, they were the subject of a data breach. <clears throat> and uh, as a result of that, uh, a variety of personally identifiable information was uh, stolen from Horizon. And this lawsuit is in the settlement stage. There's a proposed $8.733 million dollar settlement that Horizon failed to safeguard their PII. Uh, similar to the previous, uh, there, there will be a link on this that shows sort of the fiduciary training on cybersecurity, sort of reviews what the DOL has identified as best practices relative to a plan sponsor's responsibility uh, in handling PII. I think there's no question that uh, plan sponsors and their providers regularly transmit personally identifiable information back and forth. Uh, at a minimum, as a fiduciary, you should review your own practices. So how does your organization handle PII? And also invite your service providers in to talk about uh, what their safeguards are around PII. So this is definitely uh, becoming an increased area of litigation. <clears throat> Uh, use of forfeitures is also definitely an area that, that we're seeing an increase. I'll let Candace speak to uh, the Mattel case. Yeah, so the Mattel case argued that uh, the forfeitures should be used to reduce administrative fees, not employer contributions. So this is actually filed as a proposed class action saying that the toy maker had handled the 401k money, 401k plans, forfeitures monies. Um, for workers that had left during and after a really short period that they had used those to offset contributions. Um, in this case, the claim says that Mattel offset $11 million in contributions while participants paid about $6.3 million in fees. Um, similar suits have been filed as well for Qualcomm, Intel, HP, and Clorox. Uh, you know, one thing to note, one of the things to note though here is that offsetting employer contributions is allowed by the IRS. Um, so, but in this case, the plaintiffs are arguing that the, ju ju the judiciary decision that is that this is a judiciary decision not in the plaintiff's best interest. Um, and rather, you know, it's in the company's best interest. But one of the things, though, is this is really, I think, more the difference between a settler versus a fiduciary decision um, and just kind of evaluating that. But I mean, one of the things, too, is if you're doing this kind of thing, you should really make sure that this is in your plan document and that it allows for it. Yeah, this is definitely an, an interesting one. You know, these cases that challenge things, it's sort of it's somewhat similar to the ESG rule, right? You're you're challenging things that are absolutely allowed. I mean, I don't think there's any question that you can use forfeitures to offset employer contributions. What's interesting about this though is the plaintiffs are saying, yeah, but you're a fiduciary. And so even if it is allowed, you still made the wrong decision because it wasn't in my best interest. It was in your organization's best interest. Now, you know, Mattel's response is, wait, time out. That wasn't a fiduciary decision. That was a business decision that we made as the employer, which is a settler function. So I, I think this case as it proceeds will maybe provide uh, a little more insight into where that often gray line is, where uh, fiduciaries find themselves sort of wearing two hats, uh, you know, do, am I making business decisions? Because I think that's the challenge. When you look at most fiduciary committees, uh, it is not uncommon that members of that fiduciary committee also are the same business people that are making business decisions on behalf of the company as a settler. So uh, this will definitely be an interesting case to continue watching. <clears throat> The final area that we see of new cases is actually something that we're seeing in defined benefit plans, and it's called pension de-risking. And we do see a lot of defined benefit plans. Uh, you know, a defined benefit plan pays the participant for the rest of their life after they leave employment, right? And what we're seeing is a lot of these plans have been shut down, and de-risking is the practice of uh, actually purchasing. So the DB plan purchases an annuity for a large group of their participants. In return, that annuity pays, takes the place of, of the, the DB plan paying the person for the rest of their life, rather shifts that risk of paying that person over to an insurance company. 
Uh, actually, the Schlichter Bogard firm that started all the excessive fee litigation at the beginning uh, is, is sort of the one sort of leading the charge on these pension de-risk cases. Uh, three cases have been filed, <clears throat> and they all focus on the selection of the annuity provider. In all three cases, it's the same annuity provider uh, that, that was um, being selected to uh, purchase the annuities from. Uh, the allegation here is that in selecting that annuity provider, you can't just consider the lowest cost annuity provider, because obviously a, a critical consideration anytime you're buying an annuity is, okay, so can this insurance company, uh, are they solvent enough to make payments for the rest of my life? Are, are they strong enough financially that I can feel comfortable that 10 years from now, they'll still be solvent and still be able to make the claim, the payments on, on the claims that otherwise my employer would have been responsible for. So uh, what the allegation here is that the, <clears throat> the decision-making process to select the annuity provider uh, must review the insurer, the insurer's investment portfolio, the size of the insurer, their capital, their reserves, what they have in place to make payments, and also other lines of business. So really expecting a very, very deep dive into the claims paying ability of the selected annuity provider. Um, <clears throat> I think what the allegation here again is, you didn't, you made this decision based on the least expensive annuity available. You didn't make it on the, the best product to ensure that I get payments for the rest of my life. So uh, this is a case, again, I, I know uh, probably most people on the call have uh, defined contribution plans rather than defined benefit plans. But I think the lesson learned from the pension de-risking cases is, again, throughout that I think we've really seen throughout today's discussion is the process that you use to make a decision should be carefully documented and should always be done in the best interest of your participants. Because it's very clear that while the original lawsuits would claim things like you just didn't do something or you picked a bad product, Today's lawsuits are definitely pulling the minutes of all the meetings, looking at who's on the committee, look at how the decisions are being made, and trying to identify any opportunity to have what they would determine uh, decisions that are in the best interest of the company rather than the best interest of the participant, and trying to hang their hat on that. I, I think the earlier cases, uh, some of them have moved forward, but they're struggling a little bit when they're just trying to focus solely on you made a bad decision. So we're definitely seeing a deeper dive into how decisions are made. So that concludes today's litigation update. Uh, I think we finished a little bit earlier. I, I don't see any questions uh, in, in the Q&A, so I'll give it about one minute to see if there's any additional questions. And if not, then we will uh, go ahead and close a little early. Greg, do we have any uh, best practice resources for some of these? Uh, there are a couple best practice links in the in the materials, so the fiduciary training. Uh, we also have a link. We can include a link to our uh, level three training for uh, uh, for all the content that we have available. All right, seeing no additional questions. Again, thank you for taking some time to join us today for the litigation update. We're gonna try and continue to do this at least once a year and stay tuned for our um, <clears throat> stay tuned for our regulatory update that will be released next October. Thank you and have a good day.